Did you know that severe headaches could be a symptom of a disease in an entirely different part of your child's body? Find out what you need to know right now on Keeping Kids Healthy. Hi, I'm Dr. Winnie King, and I'm coming to you right from the lobby of the Children's Hospital at Montefiore in New York City. So don't be surprised if you hear a little noise in the background or even some ambulance sirens. It's all completely normal here. Can you imagine if your two-year-old child was so sick that you actually thought she might die, but no one could figure out what was wrong with her, and the doctor said that you were imagining it? And then picture this. When the diagnosis finally comes, it's a disease that's so common that it afflicts one person in every 130, but no one recognized it. Well, that's what happened to the Teitelbaum family. And because this illness is so common, it could happen to you or someone you know. So let's follow this family's journey and learn to recognize this disease because as their story shows, there are times when it's up to the parents to keep on pushing until they find the answers that will save their child. When our daughter Emma turned 20 months, she started getting sick. We thought it was something simple as a stomach flu or reflux and this went on for weeks and weeks. We were going to specialists. They told me it was reflux, gastritis, all kids throw up. Don't worry about it. She's going to outgrow it. And we started getting used to dealing with vomiting. It was now becoming daily and diarrhea just about daily as well. She stopped walking. You could look at her and you could cry. Wherever we went, people said, what's wrong with her? I mean, it was so obvious that she was so sickly and they still kept telling me she was going to be fine. Don't worry. And another doctor tells me that I'm spending too much time with her and I'm harping on all the negativity and I should go on a vacation and leave her, with, leave her home for a week and maybe everything will be cured. That it's me, that I'm analyzing everything she's eating and I'm taking everything so seriously and a little vomiting here or there didn't kill anybody. That's what they're telling me. Oh, once a day vomiting, that's not the end of the world. Listen, once a day vomiting, that was a good day. Those days were good. It was when I had six or seven and I, she couldn't sleep in her crib anymore because I didn't know if she'd wake up or, or dead, if she'd choke on her vomit. To see her so sick and so frail and go from 26 pounds down to 17 pounds in just a matter of months, that was really the point where we were just so concerned that she just might not even be here. We ultimately brought her into the emergency room at 2 in the morning, mid-July, and um, the resident, a young girl, lovely woman, and she looked at me, I said, I think Emma needs a little IV. She's so, she was black, her lips were black and under the eyes were black. And she had just been vomiting the whole night before. So I, she said, oh, she doesn't need just a little IV. Your daughter is so severely malnourished. If you had waited a day, she would have been dead. After all the months of agony and endless visits to one doctor after another, two-year-old Emma was finally diagnosed with something called celiac disease, a unique autoimmune disease. It occurs when people with a genetic tendency develop an immune response to a substance called gluten, which is found in wheat, rye, and barley. When people develop this immune response, they have an inflammatory reaction in their intestine, and this causes a whole variety of symptoms. In fact, any organ system in the body can be affected. Little children tend to present very sick with diarrhea and failure to thrive. Older children may have anemia, short stature, neurological problems, vague nonspecific complaints such as constipation or headache. For little Emma, the diagnosis and the treatment, putting her on a gluten-free diet, turned her life around. By the time we got to the holiday season, which is about four months after she was diagnosed, she had gained about six pounds. You literally could watch the weight go on her. I mean, she would say, I didn't throw up today. I don't have a tummy ache. But as dramatic as Emma's story is, the failure to diagnose celiac disease is not that unusual because the symptoms can be confused with those of other diseases. So when celiac is suspected, doctors need to do several tests, including a biopsy, to confirm that it is celiac disease. But it's a constellation of changes that you see in the biopsy as opposed to what's normal, and that allows us to at least suspect celiac disease. What doctors look for are antibodies in the blood and a set of specific genes in the patient's DNA. 
Then the doctor puts all the information together to make the diagnosis. If you've got a kid with symptoms, you wouldn't want to put them on a gluten-free diet if you weren't really sure that they had celiac disease. So we strongly recommend people having a biopsy. Colin Leslie seemed like a typical active 13-year-old when he began to feel symptoms, and they weren't the same as Emma's. It was in August of 2005, and he came home one day from music camp, and he said he had a headache. And I really didn't think too much of it because, you know, he had been blowing on his clarinet all morning at camp, and so I just figured he was, you know, reacting to that. But what happened was the headache just never went away. You know, sometimes he'd go up to bed at night and be back down in two hours because he was in such terrible pain. And he began to get joint pain in his elbows and his knees, and that just kept getting worse and worse. In fact, at the end of August, we had gone to Disney World on vacation, and we had to push him in a wheelchair the entire time we were there because he wasn't able to walk through the parks. And, you know, here's a 13-year-old boy who, you know, was active, and he just, it was like he was almost crippled from the pain and the headaches. He, you know, tried to go to school, but most days the nurse would call mid-morning to say that he had to come home because he was in such pain. A lot of times to get through the school day, he had to put braces on his elbows and his knees because he couldn't walk around the school even from class to class. The doctors you know, they did CAT scans, they did a spinal tap, they sent us to see a neurologist, a rheumatologist, and all the different tests that they were doing never really came back with any definitive diagnosis. Finally, we headed into New York City to a rheumatologist there, and he was the one who found out it was celiac disease. Although Colin didn't have any digestive symptoms, celiac disease had damaged his intestines, causing him to become severely malnourished. The solution was simple. By staying away from foods with gluten, Colin's body started absorbing nutrients again, and he began to heal. Two months after I was on the diet, I just, it was amazing. I mean, I never realized, I guess, how drained I was of energy. I was a lot more active, playing sports. I mean, it was just great. I feel like I could go for twice as long as I could before. Since celiac disease is genetic, it was no great surprise when Colin's sister, Corinne, was also diagnosed. If all the children or other family members are at risk to having celiac disease or developing it, we can look for the genes because if you don't have the genes, you can't have celiac disease. If you do have the genes, it doesn't mean that you do have it, but it means you are at risk to develop it. My husband and I actually don't have celiac, which is rather ironic that we land up with our only children having celiac disease. But it is a genetic disorder, and both of us are carriers, and we obviously passed it on, but we do not have it at this point, although if you have the gene, it doesn't mean it won't be triggered at some point in our lives. Al, uh, do you want to sit down? After Emma Teitelbaum's diagnosis six years ago, the rest of her family was tested, and doctors found the potential for celiac disease in every member of the family. We have genetically tested Jack. He has half of a gene. And right now, we're choosing to keep him on gluten, for now. The baby, we did the cheek swab, which is the newest genetic test that just came out. And he has one gene. So for now, I will keep him gluten-free. I was diagnosed this past February, was three years. And Bruce was diagnosed a year and a half after Emma was diagnosed. I had always suffered from um, a bad stomach, but didn't really think much of it. I feel almost blessed that it didn't only affect my daughter, it affected my wife, it affected me, it potentially affected my other children, it affected my extended family. So I almost feel responsible to help other families and spread the word and spread the awareness so people don't really have to suffer the way that we did. Okay, because this is so common, let's take a minute to understand what actually happens when you have celiac disease, which is also known as celiac sprue. Our intestines have little finger-like projections called villi that absorb the nutrients from our food. They actually look a lot like a shag carpet. Well, if someone with celiac disease eats gluten, that damages the villi and they wind up lying down so it looks more like a flat carpet. Now, when that happens, the intestines won't absorb nutrients like calcium, iron, fat, or protein anymore, so the person may lose weight 
have diarrhea, develop anemia, or even develop osteoporosis. A person with undiagnosed celiac disease may also develop irritable bowel syndrome or an itchy rash on their elbows or knees or thyroid problems. And there's even an increased risk of developing a kind of cancer called lymphoma. So what can you do about it? Well, there's no medication for celiac disease. The only way to treat it is to avoid eating anything with gluten in it. Now, that means no wheat, rye, or barley. Some of the foods that you have to avoid are pretty obvious, like bread, pasta, cake, and pizza. But there are also some less obvious foods that can cause a problem, like cold cuts, which may be soaking in a liquid that has gluten, or may be made with preservatives containing gluten. You know, even the smallest amount of gluten can hurt someone with celiac disease, so you have to read the ingredients on everything. You also have to avoid accidental contamination, which can happen if gluten-free foods are cooked or prepared near foods with gluten. I know it all sounds a little tough to deal with, doesn't it? Well, let's take a look at how the Teitelbaums and the Leslies have learned to live with celiac disease. I was now having stomach issues and I, I had fertility issues. It was like having the symmetrical rash, the dermatitis, hepatiformis. So Rory called Dr. Peter Green. His diagnosis, celiac disease. I said, I'm eating a bagel right now. He said, it's your last bagel, put it down, throw it away, you're going gluten-free. And he knew how I felt about gluten. I can't tell you that I embraced it as quickly and readily as Bruce. I got the phone call, they told me I had celiac disease. I immediately went on the gluten-free diet and I've never looked back. But it's hard for Emma. Living healthy with celiac disease means staying away from any food that's even been in contact with gluten. It's not really hard, except sometimes I get upset when my friends are eating like regular pizza at a party and like I want to pick the cheese off, but I don't really do it. Cereals first. Six years after undiagnosed celiac nearly killed Emma, her mother Rory is sending her off to a sleepaway camp for the first time. She's doing everything she can do to make sure Emma has a gluten-free, safe experience. We are packing all of her food, so she has all her snacks and her pasta and her cereal for breakfast without having to worry. And we are even going as far as sending a toaster oven so there won't be any contamination from toasted breads or her gluten-free pizzas that we will heat in there. And we have a pasta pot, which is really critical, and a colander for rinsing the pasta. So she will be 100% gluten-free and very safe. Do you like it? Yeah, they're good. Meanwhile, at the Leslie household, Cheryl Leslie is keeping her home completely gluten-free even though neither she nor her husband have celiac disease. That'll make it safer for the kids. The things you have to think about even are like you cannot share a peanut butter jar with somebody who can eat bread because you know you put the knife in, you take the peanut butter out, you spread it on a slice of bread, you then put that knife back in to the peanut butter jar and breadcrumbs go into it. You know the same thing with mayonnaise. So you have to think through every single thing you do when you have you know, gluten and non-gluten eating people in a household. So how was your day at school today? Good, what about you? By making the household 100% gluten free, the Leslie kids don't have to think about what's safe to eat. They can eat anything. It is easier having a gluten free household, you know, not having to worry about when you go into the pantry eating something, you can just you know, grab whatever you want. It's not quite as easy for the kids when they leave the house. When Corinne was diagnosed, she was in fifth grade, still in elementary school. And elementary school is just full of class parties. So, you know, cupcakes are always being sent in or cookies. A lot of it would come unexpectedly, so we wouldn't have any advance notice that there was going to be a treat in the classroom that day. Fortunately, a supportive school nurse let Corinne store a stash of brownies in her office freezer, so Corinne would have a safe treat for those last-minute school celebrations. But, you know, still you feel like an, you know, an outsider as a, a kid. It's hard, like, not being able to have what the other kids are having. So the cafeteria is not really equipped to deal with the gluten-free issue. Although, technically, the school does have to provide a special diet for a child who needs it, but the way that the kitchen is constructed, the possibility of being contaminated is really so great. Just to be safe, Colin usually brings his lunch to school, but sometimes he gets lucky. There is a supervisor in the high school cafeteria, 
and he actually owns a restaurant himself too and has just been so great about cooking me food. It might not even be what's on the menu. He will just go and whip up whatever in the kitchen. I mean, he'll put, you know, garlic and marinades and sauces all over it, and it's just, you know, I feel like I'm eating better than most of the other kids in the cafeteria. Going to a restaurant is also not simple when you have celiac disease. Food contamination can be a risk, unless the restaurant serves a gluten-free menu and is extremely careful when they prepare the food. Can I have the gluten-free? Yes. Thin rice noodles with shrimp and vegetables, please. As a family, when we go out, we try to go to restaurants that do, do offer a gluten-free menu because it's just easier. And also the gluten-free um, house fried rice with shrimp, chicken, and vegetable, please. Okay, yes. But when the family can't pick the restaurant, eating safe, eating gluten-free, is a lot harder to control, and there are lots of issues, decisions, and uncertainty. We have to hope, one, that the staff is receptive to our request that you know they make sure that whatever they give the children do not contain any gluten products but also we then need to sort of go through the menu and say well okay this is you know this is a no this is a no this is a no this is a possibility and then you know tell talk to the waiter talk to the manager sometimes the chef will come out if it's you know a very cooperative restaurant but you know if you hit it at the middle of their busiest time of the day they just don't have the time to really attend to that so you know there's always that uncertainty if like you ever want fries you have to ask if they grill anything else in the oil or um, like if they do chicken nuggets also in the oil or something that has bread breadcrumbs on it, then you can't have that either. So eating gluten-free has its challenges. And believe it or not, it's more difficult to eat gluten-free in the United States than it is in other countries. You can get a gluten-free Big Mac in McDonald's in Helsinki. You can get a gluten-free pizza anywhere in Australia. So it's a community awareness problem. Like with fewer people diagnosed, there's less uh, community support. New Zealand, Britain, the UK, Scandinavian countries, Italy, if you have celiac disease, you can get free gluten-free food. As more and more people are diagnosed, more products and services that cater to celiac disease are becoming available. The Celiac Center at Columbia University has teamed up with Cooking by the Book, a school where they offer classes in gluten-free cooking. One of the important things when people are diagnosed with celiac disease is there's a very slow learning curve on what do you do? How do you get through learning what to eat? And we here, we teach people to get over that learning curve kind of quickly. When individuals are initially diagnosed with celiac disease, in many instances they feel alone. This is an opportunity for them to come together to learn about healthy food, nutritional food, and we can make it great tasting. What we're going to do with this very quick very quick little recipe is we're taking some quinoa which is already which is already cooked we are just sauteing up a little bit of onion and some butter we're going to put in some corn fresh seasonal corn for the season you can add peppers you can add anything you can add asparagus you could add green beans snap green peas anything that's seasonal There are lots of gluten-free prepared foods in the stores. Entrepreneur George Chikazian started a company to make gluten-free foods partly as a result of his wife's celiac disease. Now there's product all over the place, from the smaller health food stores to the major supermarkets. But it's still very important to read the label carefully. There's a lot of hidden gluten in items like soy sauce, barbecue sauce, uh, mustard. But there are so many safe grains out there you can try, like quinoa, red lentils, brown rice, millet, arborio rice, and brown lentils. You can mix them with any vegetables and make a healthy meal. There are also a lot of safe flours you can use for baking, like a flour blend of white rice, tapioca, and potato or brown rice flour, chickpea flour, teff flour, and soy flour. Be creative, have fun, it's all gluten free.
Well, even though celiac disease is so common, it's not one of the things most people think about when they're experiencing symptoms that sometimes don't even seem to be related to their intestines. If we want proper diagnosis to become easier, both doctors and the general public have to become more aware of the disease. Nine-year-old Emma is doing her part to educate children. She starts out each school year by reading a book to her class in hopes that they will understand her condition just a little bit better. Eating Gluten-Free with Emily, a story for children with celiac disease. Hello, my name is Emily. I like to jump rope, pick flowers, and paint. I have a dog named Max. My mom says I am special. She tells me that oodles of things added together make me so special. I have freckles, I laugh a lot, I tell good jokes, and I have celiac disease. The problem with the diagnosis of celiac disease appears to be doctors thinking of the condition because it's just not on the radar of so many physicians. Newly diagnosed himself with celiac, Colin Leslie wanted to get the word out. After I was diagnosed, I mean, I realized that I was really one of the lucky ones, even though I was very, very sick. There were people that go 11 years without being diagnosed, and you know, sometimes their whole lives. So I felt that the real reason for that was because people just don't know about celiac. I mean, I've seen doctors who just have no idea what the disease is. So 14-year-old Colin took matters into his own hands and organized a walk in his town to raise money and awareness. About a month before, even three weeks before the event, I mean, I was still wondering if it was gonna happen. We barely had enough money just to pay for the venue and the insurance. But for some reason, it just seemed like with two weeks before the event, I just started getting tons and tons of checks. Colin ended up raising over $60,000. The, the future of celiac disease, I think, uh, is quite bright for people in this country um, because more people are going to be diagnosed and that's going to lead to increased availability of gluten-free food. In the meantime, Colin says the disease does make him feel a little bit like an outsider. You do feel like you are a little different than everybody else, but one thing that helps, which one of my friends told me, is that they don't view me any differently now that I have a different diet. For Corinne and Emma, overall, celiac just isn't that tough to deal with. I would say to someone who had just gotten celiac, if they're like younger than me, I would say that like don't be discouraged now that you have it. You can still live your normal lifestyle. All you have to do is just have some different foods. The foods taste fine. They, you don't be scared of the foods. That it's actually really easy once you understand it and know what you have to do. I want them to know if they get it, they shouldn't be so angry because even the foods they eat, like gluten-free food, it tastes pretty normal, my friends say. So it's not as bad. But for Cheryl, the bottom line is this. If you have any suspicion that you or your child may have celiac, speak up. The first step is a simple blood test, so why not get tested? But you really have to push your doctor for it. I think awareness is the most important thing that we can do. The diet is manageable. Of course, it's much more challenging. I get calls all the time from new parents with children with celiac disease, all the time. And they have such great stories, because I think it's so many years later. Oh, my child was throwing up for a week. We went to the doctor, she didn't gain any weight, so they tested her for celiac disease, and I think to myself, that's the point of all of this. That's it, right there, that they're not having to go through what we went through. So life with celiac disease may be different than before the diagnosis, but once you understand what foods you can and can't eat, you can learn to adapt and live a healthy and very normal life, as long as you stick to the gluten-free diet. Of course, as this whole story is made clear, the big issue is recognizing the disease in the first place. So let's go over the symptoms again so you'll know what to look for if it shows up in your child or if someone you know is having a problem in their family. First, in very young children, you may see a failure to thrive, meaning a failure to gain weight or even weight loss like we saw in little Emma. Or you might see intestinal symptoms like diarrhea or constipation or a bloated abdomen or vomiting. Poor appetite can be a significant symptom too, but keep in mind that if you see a lot of irritability, that could be a hint of a problem too, especially if you see several of these symptoms together. In older children, there are some additional signs. For example, they may just not grow as much as other kids, or they may develop neurological symptoms, or anemia, as well as abdominal pain and diarrhea. 
If you or your child have some of these symptoms, ask your doctor about getting a blood test for celiac disease. And for more information, you can visit the Celiac Sprue Association. Their website is csaceliac.org and their phone number is 1-877-272-4272. There's also the National Foundation for Celiac Awareness at celiaccentral.org and their phone number is 215-692-2639. Or you could look at the website of the Celiac Disease Center at Columbia University. Now that web address is celiacdiseasecenter.org. Well, that's it for today. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time on Keeping Kids Healthy.